are so happy to welcome you to the 30th Civil Rights Breakfast. <laughs> the Office of Equity and Civil Rights and the City of Baltimore have been hosting this breakfast for 30 years. And this year, this is the largest room that we've had. Not just like the, the physical space, but the most full. Thank you. As, as we were making our plans, we looked at what we did last year and we said, you know what, I, I, think we can, um, I think we can have 500 people. I think we can get 500 people interested in this breakfast. And then, you know, how these things go, um, and my staff will tell you, but I canceled this several times because I thought we're never going to get to 500. I'm going to be so embarrassed and we just can't go forward. And I, I don't know where my deputy is, but he said, director, have faith director, it's going to happen. And then it happened. And so we shut down the portals so people couldn't buy any more tickets. And then some of y'all, I'm not going to name names, but you know who you are, found my number, and you found Kaylin's number, and you found Khadija's number, Roland, you found Lynn. <laughs> you, you found anybody with the Office of Equity and Civil Rights, and you insisted that you be in the room. So we added a table, and then we added two more tables, and then we added two more tables. So give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> we, we are a very hearty group of 550. <laughs> so I, don't, I don't know if the Office of Performance and Education is in the room, but you know, they keep stats on everything. And y'all can check me, but I think that's a 10% a increase. Y'all will let me know. So thank you for being here. Um, the Office of Equity and Civil Rights has grown in, in lots of other ways in the last year. We have actually, as an office, grown by, I think I have this right, 104.3%. How did we do that? Um, Mayor Scott, City Council, approved the um, addition of the Police Accountability Board and all of its related entities. And that swelled our ranks tremendously. Mayor Scott also uh, brought back the Women's Commission, and, and you'll hear about that as we go through the week. And I just want to pause there. Things like that don't just happen. They happen because there's intent. And our mayor was very intentional that we bring back and revive the Women's Commission. He had a little push from a uh, little woman over there to my right, Council Pre Vice President Sharon Green Middleton, but the, yes, and the combination brought us uh, a very full and functioning Women's Commission. Some of our commissioners are here. If y'all want to stand, just, just recognize you real quickly, our Women's Commissioners. <clears throat> we also, um, with the support of the mayor and his administration, expanded the equity division. And when I started, it was like one and a half, maybe two people, and we are now uh, six people strong, which is huge, <laughs> so thank you. And, and coming soon, and if, if you know me at all, you know how important this commission is to me. Uh, we are reviving the Veterans Commission, and that will be housed in my office, and I can't wait. <laughs> Um, I, I am the daughter of a veteran and the cousin of veterans and the granddaughter and great-granddaughter of military veterans, and it's just so important that we take care of um, our veteran population. We've expanded our partnerships this year, um, in, in particular a great partnership, working partnership with Associated Black Charities and Chrissy Thornton. Chrissy, please stand. Um, she, she, she is doing amazing work, and I couldn't be happier to have a sister in the cause. So thank you, Chrissy. Um, Adiola Ajani, I don't see her. She's on her way, but she owns a, a company called Fem Equity. We connected and um, have committed to supporting her in her work. Uh, the Reginald F. Lewis Museum. We could not do this work this week. It, Rachel, it would not happen. Uh, Terry, 
Terry Freeman. Yeah, 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 you know, if you can see them, they're, they're pointed at each other. But <laughs> shared, shared responsibility, shared love. Uh, we absolutely adore the museum. We absolutely adore our partnership. We're just so thankful. Um, <clears throat> they are our presenting sponsor, and um, you know, which represents about a $75,000 support of our work, and we are awed. We are awed by that. Thank you. <clears throat> we also decided that we would do something a little different, and you're going to have this experience later in the week. Um, I read Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail, and then I reread it, and then I kept reading it, and I realized in that letter what he is issuing is a call to service of all people, including religious, persons religious. So we reached out to um, the religious community and asked them to pray for the city over the course of the weekend. And we are so thankful for all the religious institutions that, that took up that, that invitation. On Thursday, uh, Reverend Todd Yuri will hold a session in the rotunda where religious leaders from across the city will gather and reaffirm their commitment, Mr. Mayor, to Baltimore City and to working with uh, organizations such as Monsi, uh, the Office of Equity and Civil Rights, many of your institutions to uh, not just advance equity, but to fight crime and violence in our city. So we're very, very thankful. Uh, Mayor Scott, I keep mentioning your name, just very, very thankful for your continued commitment to equity and making it a priority and entrusting me and my office as your partner in the work. Thank you. <clears throat> at, as she is coming in, I also want to thank City Administrator Faith Leach. You can stay standing, Faith. <laughs> Your timing is perfect. <laughs> um, and in particular, Faith, uh, City, mm, City Administrator Leach <laughs> has prioritized our youth and really looking at what is happening with our youth and making sure that they have what they need. But, but that's not it. That's not all of it. She has done so, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, with wisdom, grace, and empathy. And it's the empathy factor that I think is making all, all the difference. So thank you for that. <laughs> also want to recognize Wells Fargo, who's one of our sponsors. You, you were with us last year, and you came back, and you're with us this year. I know Tracy Horn is here. I don't know where she's sitting, but you'll hear from her uh, later. But it's wonderful to have uh, Wells Fargo as our partner. We're very, very, very grateful that you stuck with us. So thank you. And the Foundation for Fair Contracting, we appreciate you. This is a new sponsor, and I just wanted to share publicly that their mission is our mandate, and their mandate is our mission. This is a perfect alignment. We're very grateful. And of course, yep, to the Baltimore Marriott, um, they've been wonderful in getting us to this morning. So thank you to Clara Leiden and her team. And <clears throat> I want really the greatest thanks uh, to go to the staff of the Marriott. If you like your chair, thank the staff. If you like the table where you're sitting, please thank the staff of the Marriott. Uh, yeah. And when you move to your food, which you'll be able to do in just a second, please thank the staff of the Marriott. They worked tirelessly yesterday, and they were here at I say, oh, dark 30, but I think about 5 a.m. this morning to make sure that we all have what we need. And really, these things don't happen without what I think are some of our most important uh, first responders. And those are the people that get up very, very early, and then they work all day. Some take two or three buses to get here. Thank you, Marriott staff. So as I prepare um, to take my seat, just want to acknowledge the Office of Equity and Civil Rights, uh, the Community Relations Commission Division, Mayor's Commission on Disabilities, the Equity Division, our Police Accountability Division, coming, <laughs> the Veterans Commission, the Wage, Co Wage Enforcement Commission, and the Women's Commission Division. Uh, together, um, our number one mission is to fight bias and discrimination and unfairness in Baltimore City. And as I do take my seat, I just want to ask for um, a special thoughts for 
uh, the person with whom I reside, his name is Ralph. Ralph and a tiny um, group have, Lynn, they have landed in Rome. They are in Rome to advance the cause of canonization for Mother Mary Elizabeth Lang. Many, many people told Ralph, you can't do it, you can't achieve it, you'll never get to Rome, they're not gonna welcome you. I'm not in Rome because his plan was actually to protest outside of the Vatican and I said, I'm not going to jail, for nobody, because those Vatican guards are fierce and who's gonna come get me? Nobody. So I'm staying home to take care of the grandchildren, but he actually has an appointment, I know, with the Dicastery for Causes uh, tomorrow and he will be, uh, uh, Y'all know he's persuasive, and he is trying to persuade the Pope to canonize Mother Lang and five other uh, African Americans, which would be the first six African American saints in this country. <laughs> so, thank you. We're, we're moving Baltimore's story to Italy, to Rome. Thank you very much. And who am I bringing up? Because I left my agenda. <laughs> Todd Yeary. Is Reverend Todd Yeary here? Dr. Draper is actually going to step in and uh, deliver the opening prayer. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My grandfather, Carl J. Murphy, was not only a a publisher and a hard-hitting editorial writer, as CEO, CEO of the Afro from 1922 to 1967, he was also a prolific writer of prayers. We've found some 102 prayers so far that are going into a book next year, but I thought this morning it would be appropriate to share two or three Carl Murphy prayers, so let us pray. Disturb us, O oh Lord, that we shall not be able to remain silent in the face of injustice, falsehood, evil, and intemperance. Even when we cannot right wrongs, let us actively and in good temper assert the truth in our hearts and in our minds, and so store up in this world a great reservoir of power for what is good, beautiful, and true. And all the people say amen. He also wrote this, we thank thee, God, that thou hast no chosen people, but that all men who love their fellows and practice justice and mercy are subject to thy special care and keeping. We thank thee that in our time, those long rejected through their own development and the climate created by thee, sit down, sit in, stand up, speak out bravely, in response to thy urge to add their contribution to the world's work. Lengthen our reach, help us to stand tall, strengthen our will, give us patience and endurance to hold out until the victory is won. Help us to disregard the traitors and the haters, to bolster the weak and undecided, and with truth and justice and freedom in our hearts to move forward. And the people said, amen. Now these were written like 70 years ago, so listen to this last prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we have been taught all our lives to love our country and our enemies. But it is our country and our enemies who rob us of our dignity, exploit our labor, and make us very little above the rank of servant. And so if we would be free, we must be prepared by nonviolence to work for it in defiance of our country and to the injury of our enemies. So today we pray that we shall place freedom first for ourselves and all men. And if we must violate our consciences or our laws to achieve it, we shall have no hesitation, no regrets. And the people said, amen. Now God bless the food that we're about to receive, that it may nourish and strengthen our bodies. In your name we pray. And the people said, amen.
Thank you, Dr. Draper. Uh, the food has been blessed, so certainly you can uh, feel free to enjoy what's at your table. Uh, we will uh, next sing, uh, lift every voice and sing, but I just want to mention that our accompanist today is Marco Merrick and uh, folks at the DPW table. <laughs> Uh, recognize him, and um, he is like the soloist is Robert Brown, and together they are just a little part of the the community concert choir of Baltimore. So, Marco, thank you.
I couldn't get up here fast enough to give him a hug, but my goodness, was that amazing. I have never heard it sung better, never. Marco, thank you. Um, as these things happen, I sent out a small request. Marco, can you, can you get me, um, what is that thing called, a keyboard? And could, could you sing just, just one song? And he's like, I think I can do a little bit better than that. So thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, Reverend Todd Yeary uh, is here. He's going to share with us the occasion. Come on up. Oh, wait, wait. This is Chairman Reverend Dr. Todd Yeary, Esquire, Chair of the Community Relations Commission. Good morning. Now that um, we know our breakfast will be hearty because the setup has been such a tremendous honor. I would just ask a few moments of your attention as we uh, reflect upon the purpose of even gathering in this setting on this morning, in this time, to do this work. The occasion of our gathering as this is the 30th civil rights breakfast um, that we have had it allows us to not only mark where we are in time, but to also honor the work that remains to be done. And so let me suggest to you this morning that as we have gathered, we have gathered to reflect, to recognize, and to recommit. And as we will go through this week, I think it important that we begin by acknowledging the hard work of uh, the members of the team of the Office of Equity and Civil Rights under the director, uh, direction of our Chief Equity Officer, uh, Dana Moore, and if all of the members of the staff, I know you're probably moving, just raise your hand, and I would ask all of us gathered that as you see them throughout the week that you will thank them for their work and encourage them as they continue to represent all of our interests in the city of Baltimore. That's good. 30 years requires that I think we go back and remember where we were in 1993. We had just recently come out of the first Gulf War. There was a savings and loan crisis that had upended the economy. Bill Clinton had just assumed the presidency and NAFTA was on the agenda. Racial profiling seemed to be the norm. The unsteadiness of police community interactions was growing. Education and the support of educational institutions was under attack. And yes, that was 1993, not 2023. The Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act were about to be reaffirmed. 30 years later, we find that not only has there been regression, there's been an attempt to revise the story of the country. And so our gathering as the people of Baltimore City invites us and even requires of us that we make sure that we are not part of the revisionist exercise that attempts to not only rewrite history, but to remove certain people from the enterprise of human dignity and human rights. This week, we will honor those who have done the work amongst us, who continue to make the city better, and endeavor to make sure that all of us have access to the ideal of equal opportunity. We will honor the next generation of workers in this field called social justice, children of the movement who will share what it was like not only to be the children of those who helped get us here, but how they too are endeavoring to further the work. We will gather to share collective courage as we engage in the first of many conversations about a shared vision of opportunity, access, and justice in Baltimore City. 1993 was an important year as we are marking the 50th anniversary of hip hop. Amen, somebody. Not every, not every good song is in the hymn book. 
But who knew in 1993 that Wu-Tang Clan's admonition that we should protect our neck would be more than symbolism, but it would be the seriousness of the moment in the age of what we've seen happen in the streets of Minneapolis in the killing of George Floyd. Who knew that when Snoop was talking about that summer beverage, sipping on gin and juice, that 30 years later, the drink of the day is the Kool-Aid that causes us to try to rewrite who committed what and where black folk and brown folk belong in the conversation and the enterprise of America's story. Lest we become intoxicated in this moment of our gathering, we who are serious-minded and seriously focused gather to remember that Dr. King has reminded us that there is such a thing as being too late, and there is something called the fierce urgency of now. We must remember that Dr. King's mentor, Benjamin Elijah Mays, told us it's not failure, but low aim that is sin. And so we will not only remember and recognize, but we will recommit. And so let us come together to be the charm of the city. For the charm is not only in its buildings and its history, most importantly, it is in all of its people. And so let all of us endeavor on this occasion as we mark 30 years that we will put down our red cups and not drink the Kool-Aid anymore and be the charm of the city. Welcome to Civil Rights Week. May you enjoy your day. And I just want you to know he brings the fire at every meeting at every meeting of the Community Relations Commission. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Todd Yeary. You always are on point with the reminder. I want to bring up uh, one of the newest members of the Office of Equity and Civil Rights, Tyler Sh uh, Schnella, Tyler Schnella. Um, some of you have already had the chance to work with him because he is our uh, equity legislative anal analyst and has done a lot of our equity reports on your pending legislation, so thank you. Tyler. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I have the pleasure of being able to recognize a few of our uh, elected officials that are with us this morning. I want to start with State Comptroller Brooke Learman, Baltimore City Comptroller Bill Henry. Our state's attorney, Ivan Bates. Delegate Malcolm Ruff. Delegate Kaylin Young. Delegate Regina Boyce. Council Vice President Sharon Green Middleton. Councilman Mark Conway. Councilwoman Felicia Porter, Councilman Tony Glover, and Councilman Zeke Cohen. Did I miss anybody? All right, thank you, enjoy your food. So, uh, Ty Lord just asked if he um, overlooked anyone, and, and he really didn't, because it is uh, my job to invite up Mayor Brandon Scott. He does not like long introductions, and he's already shaking his head, saying no. But he is our chief executive, executive officer of the city of Baltimore, and I talked a little bit earlier about his emphasis on equity, but he also has a strong emphasis on making sure that Baltimore is cleaner, safer, better, happier, and he has done that in so many different ways. He has taken our message around the world, frankly, uh, and certainly across the country. Uh, if you look around Baltimore, you see a lot of changes. You see cranes, you see new roads, you see new housing. You see a new emphasis on making sure that all of Baltimore has what it needs, and that is because of the great leader that we have 
in Mayor Brandon M. Scott. He's standing, he's coming, come on up, Mayor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Nope, this is Civil Rights Week in Baltimore. We're gonna do better than that. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Director, for the introduction. And this is uh, Civil Rights Week, uh, Reverend Yeri, but Wu-Tang also said bring the ruckus, and that's what we have to do in Civil Rights Week in 2023. Uh, Madam Comptroller, Mr. President, Mr. Comptroller, State's Attorney, esteemed members of the General Assembly and our City Council, and of course, uh, the most important people, the residents of Baltimore City, welcome to Civil Rights Week 2023 in Baltimore. Uh, thank you to the Marriott Hotel team for hosting us. Uh, please always, as always, thank our service workers. And before I get into my remarks, I want us all to take a moment of silence and remember and pay respects to two of our courageous public servants, uh, Firefighter EMT Rodney Pitts III and uh, Lieutenant uh, Dylan Ronaldo, who we lost in a tragic fire uh, just a few weeks ago. Please, let's pay them all a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, these heroes gave their lives for Baltimore City, and we owe them a debt of gratitude that we can never, ever repay. Uh, on behalf of the entire city, I want to thank uh, Director Moore and the team at the Office of Equity and Civil Rights for the incredible lineup of events that you'll be putting on throughout this week. And I want to encourage everyone here to tell everyone you know, your friends, your neighbors, church family, the guy on the corner, Lottie Dottie, and everybody to go out and learn about a Civil Rights Week in Baltimore and participate. Because it's my honor uh, to join you this morning as we gather to commemorate the 30th annual Civil Rights Breakfast and kick off Civil Rights Week here in Baltimore. Uh, Reverend Yeri, uh, in 1993, I can assure you, I was in a classroom in Dr. King Elementary in Northwest Baltimore, and every day uh, we learned about civil rights and Dr. Ed, Dr. King and Malcolm X, which I had the uh, opportunity to append, attend both of them. You don't. Uh, every year I always try to start off with a quote from my favorite uh, civil rights leader, which is Malcolm X. You don't have to be a man to fight for freedom. All you have to do is be an intelligent human being. We have to know and understand how serious that is right now. You heard Dr. Yeary talk about what is happening each and every day and even as I speak. The fight for justice, we know, cannot be one that's undertaken by a single individual, organization, or institution. Uh, rather, it's a collective effort that calls upon each and every one of us to be justice-minded. Justice is not a mere aspiration. It must be interwoven into the fabric of our government, workplaces, schools, neighborhoods, and our financial institutions. We need people. We need people to step up and help us lead. Uh, that is why I am so grateful for all of those who serve on a board of commission and can please everyone that serves on any board of commission, please stand for a second, please. If you're on the board and the commission, stand, stand. Let's give them all a round of applause. They do it for free 99, and we know how hard that work is. Your service is not unnoticed. Thank you for devoting your time, talents, and expertise to the residents of Baltimore. We also recognize the outstanding equity and civil rights work that we have achieved and will continue to achieve as an administration. The overarching theme of my administration has been overcoming the decades of disinvestment that far too many of our neighborhoods and residents have had to endure over the years. All of you engaged in this work know that, uh, that this was, in many cases, most cases, all cases if you ask the mayor, intentional, and an attack on our residents' civil rights. Everything my administration has done has been focused on beginning to right those wrongs. And the Office of Equity and Civil Rights is essential to that work. And just this past year, OECR has successfully stood up the new Police Accountability Board and Administrative Charging Committee. And now, uh, for the first time in history, 
Uh, civilian oversight of police misconducts is a reality in Baltimore. Baltimore is the gold standard across the state. Since June of 2023, nearly 400 decisions regarding complaints of police misconduct complaints have been made by civilians, and we have successfully been able to work with OECR's team to make sure that those folks are getting their complaints handled in the right way. We have successfully reconstituted at the, at the, not the asking, the demand of our Council Vice President, Sharon Green Middleton, thank you, Madam Vice President, the Women's Commission to help us eliminate arbitrary gender-based disparities and serve as a resource for women across the city and within city government. My administration, through our IT Office of Broadband and Digital Equity, created the city's first ever digital equity fund to tackle one of the emerging civil rights issues of our time, the digital divide. Because if you did not know, you will know when you leave here today. Having access to high speed, quality, affordable internet is like having water in 2023. You have to have it, and we're going to continue that work each and every day. The fund is a testament, really, to our dedication to addressing digital disparities that persist in our city. And with an initial allocation of $1 million, uh, we're aiming at supporting the development of community-led Decision, decision and digital inclusion plans and providing necessary resources for those plans to become a reality. The Digital Equity Fund really signifies our unwavering commitment to ensuring that the residents of Baltimore, regardless of their background, have equal access to this necessary, necessary, necessary uh, good to be able to succeed and thrive, not just as an individual, but a family in 2023. And the digital divide was just one of the many broader inequities that were exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Because let's all be honest, this is Baltimore. We know that these, these inequities have existed for longer than I've been alive, right? The pandemic just made it okay for some people to understand, oh yeah, there really are some inequities. I didn't notice that before, but COVID brought it out. So if anything positive came from the pandemic is that no one can now turn a blind eye to any inequity that exists. We have to talk about them, we have to call them out, but more importantly, we have to act on them. Uh, the pandemic also uh, highlighted some of the systemic challenges that our city faces, and it also underscored the vital role that everything in city government plays in our communities. And when you think about health and access, and when you think about something as simple as having somewhere for young people to go. It was all exacerbated by the pandemic. We know now more than ever the critical role that things like recreation centers play in the lives of our communities, especially our young people. And to address uh, another area that quite frankly had been ignored for far too long, I decided to invest $41 million into recreation and parks to help them grow into a recreation and parks department that wasn't closing rec centers as they had for so, so many years, but opening brand new ones, and quite frankly, opening those that had been closed before to make sure that every single child in every neighborhood in this city didn't just have access, and, and sorry, man, Mr. Chief of Staff, I'm about to go on a tangent, so be worried, be very afraid. <laughs> because we had for so, far too long said that any building that was open, that had a rec center on it, was a rec center. If it didn't have a full gym, if it didn't have locker rooms, if you didn't have places for the young people to actually spread out and do different things, it wasn't a rec center, folks. It was a meeting room that we called a rec center. And what we're starting to do now is build with our neighborhoods have deserved for every single year of recreation center's existence in Baltimore, and we will not stop. And it is all of this work, uh, Reverend Dr. Yeri, that is under attack. There are folks who call me each and every week and say, why are you giving all that money to recreation and parks? Why are you guys focused on equity? You have equality, why do you need equity? I think we should, uh, Dana, we should send these, these uh, cup holders that you have out to everybody so they understand the difference. We should start with some elected officials. Some elected officials don't even know the difference between equality and equity. Because what we have to do is help folks understand 
uh, that these neighborhoods deserve this. Park Heights deserves a new library, uh, Madam Councilwoman. Right. Penn North deserves Charm TV moving from downtown into Penn North, right? Woo! These neighborhoods deserve things that they've been ignored for far too long. And when you have folks that come and attack that or question that, they're really questioning why neighborhoods and people that were purposely disinvested in, that were purposely cast astray, that were purposely put in places in the birthplace of redlining to make sure that they didn't succeed, why are they now being invested in so that they can succeed? So anybody that you see that questions why we're going to be, uh, Madam Vice President, celebrating uh, finally opening new buildings and housing in Park Heights later today, why we're going to be celebrating, as soon as I shut my mouth here, a brand new inner harbor that's going to be designed and operated and owned by a black man from West Baltimore, you should challenge those folks. Because the truth is, they still believe that not every neighborhood and not every person in Baltimore matters. And that's why they're attacking the work. That's why they're asking why. That's why they're attacking our schools. That's why you don't hear that Baltimore has built or renovated more brand new schools than any urban district in the country. You don't hear that because they don't think that our young people deserve brand new school buildings. And we have to be the ones that fight back on that. They are going to try to erase history. They are trying to whitewash Baltimore into something that they want. But we, the people of Baltimore, have to stand tall and say, no, we have been ignored, we have been invested in, but now it's our time. And we're gonna get what we deserve because we're gonna demand it and we are not going to turn a blind eye to any and every action that's being taken that will try to keep us in a city that while we celebrate the history of Baltimore, that history for some of us has been so dark. Those days are over. It's now a new time for Baltimore to be the beacon of light, of equity, so that we can show to the rest of this country how, how it truly means to come back from the city to invent it, that invented redlining to showcasing how every single person in a city can be valued and invested in so they all can grow to be the best version of themselves. So that, Reverend Dr. Yeary, is what we have to do and the charge that I have to all of us, all of us is to lead that work. But uh, that work cannot be done by me alone or city government alone. We have to have the impact of folks in our community. And in Baltimore, we have the opportunity and the blessing to have so many individuals that have done that work each and every day for most of their lives. And I'm gonna mention them, our awardees today, uh, to my good friends, Joe Joan and John Brothers. Uh, your leadership uh, has mostly uh, caused an issue that is older than me, that folks would say to me every single day, 20 times a day, 50, 11 times a week, to nearly vanish. I don't even hear the word squeegee anymore. No one mentions it to me anymore because City Administrator Leaf and I tasked Joe Jones and John Brothers and Dr. Bunley, who I'll get to in a second, to co-produce a plan for how we were going to deal with this historic issue of squeegee. And they put them in the room, and of course, me being me, I said, well, look, I want, first thing I want you to do is make everybody uncomfortable, because that's the only way that we're going to truly work to solve this. And that's what they did. They got in the room. They led a group of people, including young people, that squeegee and said, this is what we are going to do as a city, showing that Baltimore can tackle tough challenges head on when we do just that. We try to actually work in a collective to handle the issue, not just appease the loud few. So thank you to Joe and John for their great work. <laughs> Dr. Bunley, good, better, best. Never let it rest until your good is your better and your better is your best. I learned that from Dr. Bunley when I was in pre-K. Uh, and Doc, you know it takes more than fancy words to reach our youth. It takes hand-on engagement. And this is what Dr. Bunley brings to his work at the Mayor's Office of African American Male Engagement each and every day. He's unafraid to reach the hardest to reach, even at the hardest time to reach people 
at like 425 yesterday when I texted him during the Ravens game and said, hey, Doc, I got two kids. I need you guys to go out here and see. This is the kind of work that has to happen. That's how we get the young brothers off the corner. That's how we do it. Because you can't go out there and tell someone that you don't have a relationship with, pull your pants up, change your name, take your kids, stop smoking weed, cut your hair, do all these other things without knowing their name, without knowing their struggle, without knowing where they are in life. And under Doc leadership, he and his team do that work of getting to know these young men and young women each and every day so that we can have the impact on them that won't just get them off the corner, but that will get them into a productive a portion, a standpoint for them and their families. Doc, thank you for all of your kind work. <laughs> Dr. Tony Draper, the Afro-American newspaper is and always will be the voice of black Baltimore. It is the best example of black media, black business, and black excellence, all of course which is personified by Dr. Draper herself. Thank you, Dr. Draper, for keeping the legacy alive, for continuing to tell our stories for our people in our way. And as a proud Afro alum, I am so excited to see this new face for the Afro-American newspaper. Let's give Dr. Draper a big round of applause. I don't see her, but I'm going to say this anyway. To my, my dear friend, Nikesha Robinson, Oh, yeah, there you are. I, can't, I, I literally can't see you. My, have we came a long way from community meetings in Northwest Baltimore. I am so proud of you. A black girl's vote is engaging women in politics like never before. <laughs> Educating, empowering black women to understand how powerful that black woman vote is, and we know it's the most powerful vote that this country has ever seen. Uh, and they also throw a pretty good party, too. She can tell you about that. You still got some tickets left, Nikesha? You got a little bit left. Y'all can see her on the side. We recognize the tremendous impact that you have and will continue to have, not just in Baltimore, but across these United States of America. Thank you so much, and congratulations to you as well. And lastly, to my good friend, uh, Dr. David Wilson, who I invite on the stage. Doc, you have to come up. We are so lucky to have Dr. Wilson as the leader of the Morgan State University. <laughs> Mayor Smoke doesn't like when I say this, but Morgan State is Baltimore's university, it's according to me. Uh, when we think about this renaissance that Baltimore is undertaking, we always have to lean and lean on and with and into that with our anchor institution as a catalyst in that transformation. We know that education can change lives. Uh, both Dr. Wilson and I are prime examples of, of that. We both found out that we both have family roots recently talking to young men uh, from farms in rural parts of the country and that we literally are our ancestors' wildest dreams because they never thought that this would happen for someone in our families. But uh, for over 150 years, Morgan has been a stalwart in Baltimore. And under Dr. Wilson's leadership, Morgan is growing and thriving. Uh, soon, they will establish a medical campus at Lake Clifton. And they've been elevated to R3 status as a research institution. And we know that they will continue to grow here in Baltimore. But at this moment, I think, uh, when I think about Dr. Wilson's leadership, it's easy to be the president of university, to be a mayor, to be anybody in leadership in good times. When things are going good, when Doc is talking about how his freshman class was the largest class that Morgan has ever had. But the true testament of leadership is when things get tough. And in Morgan's, Morgan's darkest hour, I saw firsthand the leadership of Dr. Wilson going personally and addressing his students in the midst of a tragedy, checking on them, being there, 
until the wee hours of the morning to make sure that his students were all right. And Dr. Wilson, you know, I, I said this to you then, I'll say it again, thank you. But more importantly, the city of Baltimore stands with you and all of Morgan. We will not let one incident of anybody coming onto campus disrupt the bright light that Morgan is for Baltimore. Baltimore is Morgan strong now and forever. And it is with that that I present the first 2023 Civil Rights Impact Award to Dr. David Wilson. Congratulations, sir. Dr. Wilson also has a certificate of recognition from uh, the mayor, and the award is a little bit heavier than we realize, so <laughs> trying not to drop the ball, literally not drop, drop the globe. We are um, at a, a point where we're ready to just take a little pause, let you enjoy your, your breakfast. I hope it's still hot. Um, if not, we have little bottles of hot sauce uh, for you. <laughs> And I think they say, keep it hot. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we will be back. When you hear um, our soloists and accompanying this playing, you'll know that it's time to come back to your seat, gather, and we'll continue our program. The mayor has to get over to um, the BDC event. I know some of you do as well. And uh, just thank you again for being here. We'll take a little pause. Enjoy your breakfast. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show traveling wrong then my living shall not be in vain if I can do my duties as a good man Art. If I can bring back beauty to a world abroad, if I can share love's message like a master taught. My living shall not be in vain. Then my living shall not be in vain. No, my living shall. 
vain if I can help somebody as I go along then my living shall not be in vain then my living shall not be in vain my living shall If I can help somebody as I go along, then my living shall not be in vain. Then my living shall not be in vain. Then my living shall not be in vain. In vain. Thank you, Robert. It's the most amazing voice, absolutely beautiful. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and that is the perfect song to um, help us bring forward um, two, two sponsors who, without their help, I don't think we would be here today, and we certainly wouldn't be here in these large numbers. First, I'd like to bring up Tracy Horn from Wells Fargo. Uh, you, some of you might know her, her, her co-partner, her partner at Wells Fargo is Otis Rowley, and he couldn't be here today, but um, the support that we receive from Wells Fargo is in no small measure because Otis um, knows the city, he knows our work, and felt that um, he could put some of the resources of Wells Fargo to us. So Tracy, please come forward. Thank you. And good morning, again, as shared. My name is Tracy Horn, and I am the Senior Social Impact and Sustainability Partner for Wells Fargo. I've been blessed with an opportunity, and I've been tasked with the responsibilities to our communities. And this is something that I do not take lightly. Wells Fargo's mission is to strengthen historically marginalized communities and those who are underrepresented. And we're doing this under the primary focuses of small business growth, sustainability and resilience, financial health, and then housing access and affordability. In addition, I proudly support initiatives such as the Office of Equity and Civil Rights. This is a testament to our commitment to promote justice, diversity, inclusion, and contributing to a more equitable society. This is more than a sponsorship. This is an investment. Our investing in the Office of Equity and Civil Rights is a significant because it demonstrates our commitment to social responsibility and equality. This not only aligns with our corporate values, but it also cultivates positive community relations. 
and ultimately benefiting our communities. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge Ms. Dana Moore and her team, because it really is, it's, it's, yes. We've had some interesting exchanges, and those exchanges are appreciated because it takes a lot of work to pull this together. It takes those who are the boots on the ground to fulfill what needs to be done so that things can be done, so that changes can be made, so that Baltimore can be better. So I say this, and I know we bring forward and we talk about Otis Rowley, but Maryland is my territory, and I'm here to represent, and I'm here to show up, and I'm here to make impact and a difference, because together, we can do better for Baltimore and make Baltimore better. So thank you all. Thank you all for all you do. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thanking Tracy, and she really has been a stalwart <clears throat> in our efforts to make today happen, and, and more of our good works happen throughout the week. I mentioned the Reginald F. Lewis Museum and Terry Freeman um, in my introductory remarks, and <clears throat> I'm going to ask Terry to come forward and to share some thoughts with you, and just want to some, sometimes thank you just doesn't seem strong enough. Um, we partnered with the museum last year, and we did a lot together, but we agreed we didn't do enough. And so this year, we've been much more intentional and, and committed and focused. And I want to thank, personally, Rachel Graham for showing me what partnership is. Um, I'm not the youngest person in the room, and I may be, well be one of the oldest, and sometimes I think there's really nothing you can tell me that I can't learn. Oh, I know I'm not the oldest because my former boss is older than me. <laughs> former city solicitor Andre Davis. But Rachel very kindly and gently taught me how to be a real partner, and so thank you. And thank you, Rachel. And Terry Freeman has walked with us this year. Karan Watkins, our former Deputy Chief Equity Officer, brought us to the museum and brought uh, Terry Freeman to us to really educate us and enlighten us. And I think she's going to do that again. Come on up. Thank you so much for all that you do, not just for us, but for all of Baltimore. They are, they are the community square. They are the public square. And you'll hear why. Thank you Thank so you. much. Good morning, everyone. I promise I will not take too much time, but I am going to take a couple of minutes. When I, when I walked in this morning, one of our staff said, oh, so you're giving remarks. I said, who's giving remarks? They said, you're giving remarks. I said, oh, I am? And then I looked and I saw that um, on that front page, there was a picture of Dr. King behind um, the, the jail bars. And I said, oh, so this is what we're going to be talking about. We're going to talk a little bit about this letter from a Birmingham jail. So first, I want to just thank Dana Moore for giving us the opportunity to partner. And it's not something that, you know, really she didn't even need to ask because this really is a responsibility that the Lewis Museum should fulfill. But some of you may know that prior to my coming to the Lewis Museum, I was the president of the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. And there's an installation there um, that is a replica of a jail cell. Um, and it talks about the letter from Birmingham jail. <clears throat> and over my years there, the letter from a Birmingham jail became my favorite writing of Dr. King's. Now, if you all have never read a King speech or a King book, I implore you to do that, because otherwise you're just getting snippets of who this person was. But the letter from a Birmingham jail is particularly of interest to me because he was talking to his peers. The letter was written on little pieces of paper that he snuck out of the jail cell, and he was writing to clergy because clergy 
was kind of saying, let's just stick with the status quo. And there's a message in this for us today. Let's just stick with the status quo. It's going to be OK. So I'm going to paraphrase a few of the quotes that are in the letter that are so meaningful then and now. And the first was, King said, the Negro has always heard the term wait. Wait has always meant never. So when we are being told, well, just wait, <laughs> just wait, I say, think about how long we have to wait. The second was that these clergy were allies. They were the people who were walking with him. And he said, I have come to believe that the Negro's greatest enemy and biggest threat is not the Ku Klux Klaner or the white, I can't remember the name of the group, the white moderate. No, well, no. He actually was saying that, in fact, the enemy is white moderates who believe more in order than they do in justice. Sometimes justice is messy. And we have to be OK with messy. Sometimes it's not pretty. Sometimes there are things that need to be said that don't necessarily go with the status quo. But if we want justice, we have to do what is right. Finally, Dr. King said in um, this letter that power is never going to be given up freely by the oppressor it will have to be taken by the oppressed. He didn't say that for us in 1964, I think it was. He said that for us today. We have a responsibility to ensure that the fight continues. We need to bring as many people along on the path on this fight as we can. But if you are here focused on order, you may be in the wrong fight. I thank you, Office of Equity and Civil Rights, for having this week of activities. I declare her my sister because we share that as our favorite writing by Dr. Martin Luther King, because it kind of wraps us all up in one, in one paper or series of papers. Thank you, <clears throat> Terry Freeman, Reginald F. Lewis Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to bring up one of, actually, I think Lana Asuncion Bates really is our newest uh, staff member. She's going to share um, something that we were asked to do because there's so many um, entities in Baltimore that are doing amazing work, and we just wanted to give a little recognition um, of them. So, Lana? Good morning, good morning. Good morning, family. Nice to see you. I'm Lana Sunsion Bates. I am a new member of the Office of Equity and Civil Rights. I'm so glad to be here with you. This is my first time here at this breakfast. Um, and it's my job to introduce those people who are moving and shaking in Baltimore City, those that we want to keep our eyes on and watch. So the first uh, folks that we have up here, Pose Heights Neighborhood Association. If you're here, could you just please stand? If you're here, please stand. Pose Heights was established by Grandinson Ho, a freed slave in the antebellum Baltimore. Um, Holes Heights is located in North Baltimore. I know that's important for some of us where we are located, North, East, South, and West Baltimore. Um, in 2022 and 23, Holes Heights experienced some challenges, and they came together and fought back. They are a true example of when you fight, you win, and we shall overcome. Holes Heights 
uh, Host Heights Neighborhood Association. Let's keep our eyes on them. They are doing some amazing work in the community. The next folks that we would love to uh, keep our eyes on is the Baltimore City Veterans Commission. As was mentioned earlier, uh, the Office of Equity and Civil Rights is now going to be reviving and helping the Baltimore City Veterans Commission come back to life. Um, I'm excited about this as a proud daughter of an Army, highly decorated Army veteran. Um, I know how important it is for our veterans, the work that they have done, and it's important for us that we now take on the, uh, the battle for them to protect the rights that we have and to reclaim the rights that they fought for us that we have lost since they have been uh, doing this work. So we are excited to have the Baltimore City Veterans Commission with us. Our next group of folks, are there Baltimore City Veterans Commission? Anyone here from the Baltimore City Veterans Commission? No, let's give them a round of applause. Nonetheless, thank you. Chrissy Thornton and the Associated Black Charities. Is anyone here? Chrissy Thornton, thank you so much. Chrissy Thornton and the Associated Black Charities. That's we, Chrissy Thornton is our new president. Uh, she has brought a new focus to the charities, new energy, uh, amazing leadership, and our partner in the work of equity and civil rights. Thank you so much for all your hard work. Another round of applause for Chrissy Thornton, please. And last but not least, we have uh, Robert and Jason Murphy and the Murphy Enterprises Companies. I do believe Ms. Robin is here. Thank you so much. And Mr. Murphy, thank you so much. We're going to ask you to come up to the stage just in case you didn't know that. <laughs> but in the meantime, these are what we are known calling affectionately our Ravens family. Um, they are absolutely 100% paying it forward in some amazing ways. They started their business as a mission to hire returning citizens and help them get back on their feet. And they are growing fast, growing furiously, and we are so happy to be partners with them. Please come on up and say a few things for us. Thank you for your hard work and dedication. Good morning. Um, First of all, thank you, Dana. Uh, she has been big sister and um, mentor to me for many, many years. Probably Jason was still playing, maybe. Yeah. But um, I get to be the, uh, he gets to be the brains of the operation and I get to be the mouth, which is great. And they asked us to talk a little bit about uh, one of our core missions of our company, which is that we focus on hiring returning citizens. I'm gonna back up and say that we are two kids from West Baltimore, Edmondson Village, specifically Edmondson High School, Go Red Storm. And we've lived a lot of places um, during the course of Jason's football career. And then when we returned back home, where he ended his career as a Raven, uh, and then there was, what are we doing next? And we decided on building businesses but baking into those businesses, how can we have an impact in our city and in our community that would be meaningful? And so that is a core pillar. And the thing that Dana asked me to talk about today is hiring returning citizens. And one of the most important things that we can do as a community is to restore the civil rights to citizens who have served their time and are returning to society. We know that generations of mass incarceration can only be course corrected by generations of pouring in investments into those who have been disproportionately affected by mass incarceration. And that is primarily the black family, black men, black children, black communities. But that's not the primary reason why we baked hiring returning citizens into the work that we do in our, in our companies which are in logistics, construction, consulting, and a lot of things. Another reason is that if you live, work, play, entertain, raise a family in a community, it is up to you to also be invested in the economic sustainability and the growth of that community. And one important way that you can do that is to be a partner in crime reduction in all the ways, including support for marginalized people 
like those who are re-entering society. But that also is not the whole picture for us as business people and as employers. The bottom line is that it's a sound business decision too. Hiring and maintaining a workforce can be challenging and we experienced uh, new, newly returning citizens who were being rejected from employment for crimes that they had already paid their debts to society for, which really just is a cycle of putting them back in a position to commit crimes. So we began partnering with Joe Jones and the Center for Urban Families, with the city of Baltimore, with Hopkins, with University of Maryland, and other places in order to expunge records and to increase the employability of returning citizens. And let me tell you, uh, most people who come to work for us as a returning citizen are dedicated and hard workers. They are committed, they rarely complain, and they are grateful for the opportunity to earn a living wage to set their families on a course for success for future generations. And it's a win-win. And we are, in fact, grateful for the opportunity to have that kind of impact. So thank you. The reason I wanted Robin and Jason to speak is because I, I feel like what they're doing is what we should all be doing, which is taking care of our brothers and sisters that need the most help. And when we hire returning citizens, we are doing exactly that. We're in, in no small way, in a huge way, making Baltimore better. So thank you, Robin and Jason. <clears throat> we're gonna move now to our impact awards, and we're doing it a little different this year. Um, Samuela from my office is going to present the first award, and that'll go to, Nick, actually the second, uh, to Nikija Robinson. And we thought that it was just amazing that Samuela is a, a member of Black Girls Vote, and we loved that she's presenting to you. So come on up, Samuela and Nikija. Um, good morning. <laughs> it's an honor to be up here giving Nikija Robinson her flowers as a young lady that has directly benefited from her amazing work. Every time I hear Nike speak, she always talks about how important it is for her to make sure she isn't the only black woman in the room and make sure there will be other black women following after every door she enters and every ceiling she breaks. And it's not just words, she really means it. And you can tell through the collegiate chapters of Black Girls Vote. By the time I was graduating college, I was vice president of our BGV chapter and it opened up so many experiences, opportunities, mentorship, resources, and networks for me. Thank you so much, Nike, for being a trailblazer, following your passion, and always advocating for and with black women. Congratulations on your Impact Award. I just want to say thank you so much. This is a surprise. Uh, Sammy was a uh, member of Black Girls Vote at American University, so our second collegiate chapter. So to see her, I mean, it truly brought tears to my eyes because you never know the lives you're touching. So on behalf of Black Girls Vote, we have a team of members here. Thank you. You all see me all the time, but it's truly the people who are behind me. So thank you, ladies. Thank you all so much, and it is truly an honor. Inviting up uh, Lisa Kelly uh, to present the award to the Afro-American Newspapers and Dr. Francis Tony Draper. Good morning. 
Dr. Frances Murphy Draper is the current chairwoman and publisher of the Baltimore-based Afro-American newspapers. She holds degrees from Morgan State University, Johns Hopkins University, University of Baltimore, Loyola University, Maryland, and the United Theological Seminary. After 20 years of faithful service, Dr. Draper retired from her role as pastor of Freedom Temple AME Zion Church last year. Under her leadership, her congregation was highly active in outreach and service to communities throughout Baltimore City. They held back to school festivals, food and holiday giveaways, community dinners, and voter registration drives. The Afro is the longest family held, continuously published black newspaper in the United States. Dr. Draper stated that although the pandemic presented a challenge to the Afro, it was a good challenge because with the combination of the presidential election, the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, all happening within a relatively short period of time, it put a spotlight on the fact that black lives do matter and the black-owned press matters as well. Dr. Draper went on to say that the Afro has no regrets about being an information company for and by African Americans. She said, that's our niche, that's what we do. Dr. Draper has been an influential community leader in Baltimore for decades. With leadership positions in journalism, the faith community, and education, she continues to inspire us all. Please help us honor Reverend Dr. Francis Murphy Draper, otherwise known as Pastor Tony. Thank you so much for this award. Um, the Afro is also the oldest black business in Maryland. We could not do what we do, however, without a talented team of people, some of whom are here today. And so we thank them. We thank you for your support. And anytime I get the mic, I'll remind people, we're not a newspaper. We are a media company. We want your stories. She's gonna love me for this. Email editor at afro.com. <laughs> if you have a story, and we want your support. So please go to afro.com. Thank you so much, Dana, for this award. And thank you all for your support over these 131 years. And we hope to be here another 131 years serving this community. God bless you. Our, our next uh, Impact Awards go to uh, Joe Jones, John Brothers, and Andre Bunley. And we um, were, it's a little bit of a surprise as to who the presenters are. And I'm going to let them tell you, you know, exactly who they are and how they happen to be here. But I'm going to welcome them up and... Just uh, pay, pay close attention because the, the, the story of, of these presenters is just absolutely amazing. So come on up, gentlemen. Are you ready? The podium is yours. <laughs> How y'all doing? My name is Shaquem Tindall. I wanted to give a big shout out to Joseph Jones and uh, John Brothers. Squeegee helped me a lot, you know, gave me more opportunities. But one thing I can say is Dr. Bundy and them changed my life a lot. It gave me more ways to live, not 
just be out here doing anything. Man, I appreciate y'all out here too as well, you know? Make us feel more motivated to do something, to make a change to the city. Anything we can do, we're gonna do it, you know? For real. The last thing I want to say is, um, the last thing I want to say is that um, with the squeegeeing stuff, it's not easy. You know, like, you never think nobody would come save you at all, uh, because there's no opportunities. Some of us got one parent, some of us got no parent. So with that help, it changed my life. It got me back in high school. My son, five years old. I thank y'all, man, for real. Everybody, my name is Dominic Newton. Uh, I'm here to give a thank you to Dr. Bonnie uh, and uh, the John, Johnson brothers too. But I want to say thank you to Dr. Bonnie because Dr. Bonnie and his crew was the ones coming out on the squeegee block every day that I know of, letting the kids know that, yeah, they raised stop this. We're going to help y'all get a job. We, the, we know what to do, stuff like that. And like, they really helped us in a lot of stuff that if we ain't had them, we probably would have been in jail. But thank you, Dr. Bali, and Miss Tracy and everybody else, and love everybody else. Oh, oh, oh. Now we would like for the Johns, wait, the Johnson brothers and Dr. Bonley to come up here. We really did not rehearse this. Um, so, uh, why don't we start with Dr. Bunley, Joe Jones, John Brothers, if y'all could just present the awards to them, and then each of you can uh, take the podium and, and just share a few words. But if you haven't figured it out, these gentlemen used to be on the corner, and they used to squeegee. And <laughs> it is because of the, the belief in them that our city administrator showed, and Take no, make no mistake, our city solicitor, Ebony Thompson, and members of the Squeegee Collaborative, but importantly, Dr. Bunley, Joe Jones, who's the co-chair of the Squeegee Collaborative, and John Brothers took in really making a difference and changing the trajectory of not just these lives, but the whole city. So thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Dana's making it really hard. We always bring our young people before us so that you can clearly see what the vision is. People talk about having a why. So you got to keep them in front of you so you know what your purpose is. And so I like to thank the Office of Civil Rights, but nobody does anything alone. Nobody. So I'm just a recipient for the award for table, what's that table, what? Stand up table 12. Thank you so much. Mayor Brandon Scott. <clears throat> he always tell that story. But I did remember him sitting at Park Hill Daycare Center. That uh, Malcolm X Elementary School, which actually was the preschool before the elementary school. 
And to see him doing what he does, real happy for him. Because that's what it's all about for those of us who are educators. It's you, Faith Leach. <clears throat> These people are serious about children. I don't mess with people that aren't serious about children. I'm a former educator. I was his mom's principal. So it's a purpose in what we gotta do. For those who deal with the returning citizens, you're right on point. We're gonna get this done. We're gonna get this done in Baltimore. The partners help get this done. Division U Services, the stands for you. Although they are part of Monzi, we have two geniuses. And all of the people in Monzi are wonderful people. But I've seen two geniuses in action. Mark Mason and Rick Leandri. How have we done this work? We've done this work through collect collaborative and effective messaging. I'm so thankful for my, oh, I, my Faith Leach was my first boss, and then she handed me off to Dr. DeRaza. She's super fantastic as well. But I'm so, th you can give her a hand. But we have the, we have the, the formula now. Collaboration and proactive messaging. Messaging is about action. So when you see a youngster out there who's panhandling and you see that individual's out there, the message is that the police call the outreach worker. The outreach worker is dispatched to the corner. You gotta see the picture. You gotta give them the picture to see. Because everybody's been talking about what they're gonna do with and for them forever. And they don't show up. So we gotta show up. So we know how to do restorative messaging, and we know how to now change mindset, emotional sets. The mind, wherever the mind, their minds are gonna be, wherever our minds are gonna be, that's where we show up. Whatever you put on your mind, that's what you're gonna manifest. And so we know what to do. Now the question is, are we gonna all collaborate? We have the message and we're gonna do what we know. And that takes everybody. So I'm thankful for the Office of Civil Rights and your purpose. And we got to go get this done. Thanks, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Joe Jones. Uh, I'm now, forever and more, I'll be known as the Johnson Brothers. <laughs> and I know they're not going to let that go. Uh, just a few things for me. Brothers, this is all about you all, right? Y'all get pressed every day to do something different. And you all have stood up and did something different. When this young man says some of us have one parent, some have no parent. I think everybody in here knows how much pressure is on these young men to try to stay right. What would be the ideal situation if we could pass them off to Dr. Wilson? Can y'all can y'all see that? Can y'all envision that? Right? I'm grateful that uh, Mayor Scott charged this group with bringing together a cross section of Baltimore. And when I say a cross section, in fact. Everybody in here could be a part of the Squeegee Collaborative. That's how vast and wide the group became. It was unwielding to try to keep that many people together with very prickly, sensitive conversations that had to do with inequity, that had to do with poverty. Just because these young men are no longer on many of our corners, poverty did not go away, right? And the efforts to support them going forward have to be sustained. Uh, but I want to be clear about a couple of things. We did this work 
because we were charged with not overcriminalizing. We did not want to arrest these young men and young women. We want to create pathways to opportunity for them as an alternative to squeegeeing. Some of that has happened. Not enough of it has happened to make it a sustained effort, right? It also had to be constitutional. So we had two drivers. We had CEO, then Deputy Faith Leach, driving us batty every goddamn week about, come on, let's get this plan done. And then we had solicitor Ebony Thompson talking about this has to be done constitutionally. This will work, this won't, and don't stray, right? And so we had people who were committed, who were competent, who were caring, that said we can get this done together, and we produced the squeegee working action plan. And as a result, we have young people who are no longer on every corner in Baltimore City, right? But we still have people who have bled over, so the work continues. The final thing I want to say, Tracy Eastap, please stand up. Tracy, stand up. Doc, come here, man. I want you to know how hard these two individuals work with their team and some of their external partners. That work doesn't stop at 4 o'clock, at 5 o'clock. They're taking calls from the mayor, from Faith, from Shalonda, and others to really stay on the neck of this issue. That means 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. They're spending money out of their own pockets sometimes to make sure that a young person gets to eat because they call and say, I can't eat right now because I don't have the money, right? This is real community work, right? Faith, Ebony, Tracy, Doc, and I don't want to leave out the Baltimore City Police Department particularly Deputy Commissioner Jones, who has to take and bear the brunt of us looking at data and pushing ourselves to the de 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 deployment strategy when we know a young person is on a corner, to get to that corner, and when they morph to another corner, to be nimble enough to be able to get to that corner, right? This is the work that is taking place across this city because of all of us. Thank you, Baltimore. Any time that I'm grouped with Joe Jones and called brothers, I'm, I'm honored to do that. And I'm also um, honored to have done this work with faith and so many, so many folks. I'll just be really brief. Um, the first thing I think I would want to acknowledge, and it's a line in the beautiful song that uh, Mr. Brown sang, any world in which that voice lives just uh, makes me feel like everything's going to be OK. But the line is, Stony the road we trod. Squeegee is an issue that's been in the city for 50 years. This is not new. There are a lot of people over the last 50 years that worked on this issue. Uh, we had the good fortune to stand on their shoulders and do this work. Um, but this is an issue that if anybody brought up the word squeegee around Thanksgiving time, you get a lot of opinions, a lot of feelings, lots of thoughts. Um, and what I believe is the civil rights issue, one of the leading civil rights issue in Baltimore for the last 50 years is an area in which the second quote I would say is all of us together, 150 leaders came together over eight months to work on this. In a world that is unbelievably divisive, where it's hard to get two people to come around the table to get, agree to get agreement. We got 150 people around the table over eight months to agree on an issue that over the last 50 years had been tried seven times before. And so I would want to recognize the, the leaders that got their fingernails dirty on this issue over those long, long months uh, to ultimately come up with a solution that's really hard. That other cities around the country looked to us and said, how did you do that? And the only way in which that could have happened is by collaborating with multiple voices from all walks of life coming around the table the most important voice, these young people behind me. To bring back hip hop because I can't help myself. Um, these, these young folks were trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents, to quote Tupac. And we got to know them not only through their hard work and through the unbelievable circumstances that they were going through, but what we got to know them as is leader of our, of our city. And we have a lot riding on, on them, and we're so proud of them, just so proud of them. Um, and so I want to give them a round of applause. Because as we're thinking 20, 30 years down the line about what happened here, and you should know, the Squeegee Collaborative is really important work that actually, honestly, only Baltimore could have done because of our beauty, grit, and grace. These young people are going to be the ones that are going to be talking about 
this work. And so again, I'm just so proud of them and so thankful uh, to be honored along uh, myself, Joe, and Dr. Bunley. Thank you again. As, as they get their awards presented, just join me in another very warm round of applause for the Squeegee Collaborative for Joe Jones, John Brothers, and Dr. Andre Bunley. And gonna, they want you to, uh, Brother Jones, they want to take a photo of you. So if you could come on back and get a photo with um, the young men. We're, we're, we're struggling over notes. Um, thank you so much for allowing us to honor you and um, making Baltimore better. Um, as we turn to close, I, I do want to do two things. I want to thank uh, Deputy Kalen Young. Some of y'all, yeah. <laughs> Some of you know him as Delegate Young. We at the Office of Equity and Civil Rights know him. Uh, well, actually, sometimes we call him Dep Dog. <laughs> But he's our deputy, and, and he was very um, instrumental in making today happen and making it uh, flow smoothly. And uh, Chief of Staff Khadija Fairmond, who has, thank you, Khadija, <clears throat> uh, managed all of the, the back of the house fiscal parts of, of, this, of this. And I don't know if she's still here, but um, just, just want to recognize my daughter, uh, Nia Moore. I think she's at table 35. She might have had to leave to go to work already, but uh, that is my heart walking outside of my body. Thank you, Nia. There she is, uh, my, my beautiful daughter, and uh, just really holds down the fort for the family in so many ways, so thank you. We are uh, ready to close out. Thank you for being here. Um, it's amazing. I wish that you could look out and see what I see. One, the room is beautiful. You all are beautiful. But most importantly, you're still here. And our program, program went longer, and, and you stayed. And there, there's one person that I, that I wanted to mention. When you think about whether um, you, you're doing the right thing, whether you're on track, and I can find it. Oh, do 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 We received a, a lot of support, a lot of donations. And there was one in particular that stood out for me. And it, it came from, we, we need the large donations and we need the in kind. But when I questioned whether we were on track and whether we should have this week, um, I noticed that we received one donation that just really stood out for me. And it came from Delaware. And it came from a woman by the name of Octavia Williams. And the donation was $10. It was a $10 donation. And that just said to me, if someone is willing to peel off their lunch money, their bus money, their car fare, and give it to us, um, that, that, sm that small amount spoke volumes to me. So Octavia, if you're here, if you're in the room, thank you for that small gift. It means so much to us here at the Office of Equity and Civil Rights. Thank you. So, with that, I'm going to ask all of our award recipients to come forward uh, as the crowd, uh, wow, it sounds like I'm in school, it's going to say dismisses itself. Um, exits, we're going to just ask our award recipients to come forward for one group photo. Thank you. We will see you Monday, October 7, 2024. Get your tickets early. We'll be back. Thank you very much. <laughs>